happy to see the, the room is filling up. Uh, we're really happy to have Mikhail Merkatz up next. He's going to talk to you. He's going to talk to us about his work on uh, Otsuk, the uh, first animated feature um, animation uh, ever produced in Austria. We're also very honored to have Josef Eichholzer here. He's the producer. Bernd Apple somewhere, he did a lot of the, well, basically all of the stuff. <laughs> uh, and probably some other people who helped uh, on the production that I, oh, yeah. <laughs> so everyone who's worked on the project, feel free to stand up in the end and uh, get a part of the applause, hopefully. Um, yeah, without further ado, Michael Merkatz. Hello, everybody. I, I, I start to add just two more people that are here from the production, right? We have Aaron uh, here, who was an animator. Uh, and um, uh, Tom, uh, who also was an animator, and we're going to see. Yeah, a warm welcome to all of you. Excited that the room got so full now, and uh, also very overwhelmed. Like when Tim called me to and asked me if I want to do that, I felt like, oh yeah, of course. But as usual on these productions, right, we have these huge teams working on that. So I'm standing in front of you for quite a big group of people who mostly adore, basically. Um, uh, yeah, the production of that movie was a more than ten years journey for a bunch of people who have never done something like that before, right? In the first row, Josef Eichholzer, who is here, um, uh, a, a Austrian film producer for decades, you know, he would uh, be part of or be the founder of most of the uh, important uh, institutes in uh, Austria that deal with Austrian film. Uh, he actually got an Oscar, uh, one of his movies got an Oscar, uh, Die Fälscher. So, <laughs> It was clear for me from the beginning that the format of this man was actually the reason that the film could uh, happen uh, in Austria. So I appreciate that a lot, Josef. <laughs> um, of course, Manfred Dykes, uh, who unfortunately couldn't see the result on the big screen because he died in 2016, but um, his wife, Marietta Dykes, would jump in and would just support the movie till the premiere um, in 2022, so we also appreciate that a lot. It's impossible um, to honor, uh, honor all the hard work and, and, and passion that flew in that uh, movie. So I'm really happy to be here. I always felt a little bit that the movie didn't get the um, recognition in Austrian CG industry that it kind of deserves, right? So that's a great uh, way to bring into an audience that probably wasn't in the cinema for it. I don't know. My name is Michael Merkatz. I'm a character animator. Um, around 10 years ago, I was sitting down there, was soaking up every detail I could get out of these talks. Um, I hope I, I can kind of give that back to you guys a little bit. Um, first, I want to show uh, a small teaser that was created for the Annecy submission, where the, act uh, where the movie then actually um, premiered.
I want to give you a little bit of background story. The movie plays in the mid-60s, right? Uh, it was a, a harsh environment to kind of grow up, especially, for, for, uh, especially on the countryside. Um, as you can see in the movie, there are actually uh, signs of the past basically everywhere. I mean, well, it was gone, obviously, but it was not that far. So, um, you have uh, uh, young people that would not know a lot of facts about that time, right? There was kind of this blanket of silence above the, the, the time during World War and, and the cruelty that comes with it. Um, eventually, kids would at some point find out that town people or probably even family members were kind of part of the darkness, whatever it meant in detail. That must have been quite a shock for these kids, right? So we have a, a very dishonest time on the one side, and on the other side we have this young boy who is just drawing what he sees and what he loves, right? Um, uh, what he can explore on a daily basis, and he would not be ashamed of anything. So this was quite uh, an interesting uh, situation. Um, in his early years, he was not so political. He actually uh, drew cartoons for a Catholic uh, magazine, right? So his aversion for the church was probably not more than the hate for his teacher um, uh, or, or something like that, right? Um, my father grew up in Felixdorf, which is a small, um, which is a small uh, village next to Wiener Neustadt in the south of Vienna. Um, my father was not just a big Manfred Dax fan, which would just put a little bit of pressure onto my shoulders. Uh, he also could reassure me that exactly that happened. Like Roma people would come to the village basically every year, right? They would build trailer yards, as shown in the movie, and they would sell all kinds of stuff um, uh, to the town people there. Yeah? Uh, it was a time of change, a time of freedom with more possibilities. So that was the other side that you could feel, obviously, in the mid-60s as well, a lot. Um, since Roma would travel, uh, travel around and would obviously visit a lot of different areas, would see more different cultures than uh, people in, in, a, in a town village like uh, Sikalkirchen, um, they kind of brought some innovation uh, to these villages, actually, right? Like, my father told me that uh, these uh, guys were the first one that would drive like these big um, uh, American cars, like the Amischlitten, right? Um, and yeah, they brought they brought some innovation to some regards. He remembers them as he remembers them as uh, impressive, friendly people, who yes, sometimes looked a little bit dangerous as well, especially to a ten to twelve year old, right? Um, this is the setting. Uh, where our hero grew up, and where also this cartoonist grew up that we all like so much, right? Um, Manfred Dijk's first years and the script, um, a key, uh, the, the script of the movie is key, I mean everyone is going to say obviously, yes. Uh, so um, it took actually five scripts and two script writers until Manfred would agree and was really happy with what was shown, uh, what was, uh, how, the, how the script was written, right? Um, I don't, I can't imagine what it means to, to, to get something that is describing part of your life, right? And then you have to decide, okay, this is what I want, to, that, it, it, that, uh, that what I want to show to the public, right? So, um, I totally get it. I got uh, told that when he read that last script, uh, he would call uh, Josef and would tell him that he was touched by it and that he was really, really happy by it. And then he would uh, send a fax. <laughs> uh, Manfred was using fax a lot, like it was 2011. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's a really, really beautiful story. The thing is, for that reason, the quality of the picture is not like that big because it was actually sent via fax to the office of, of Josef. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically saying, I don't know if you can really read it, but it's basically saying like, he's happy that like a, hun a hundred years baby was finally born, right? 
And in, in, as Dykes would do it, like the nurse would say, Tun schön pressen, Herr Dykes. Umso schöner wird es putzen. <laughs> um, a beautiful story. You can see here April 5th, um, 2011. So, yeah, that was basically the moment um, when the script was approved uh, by the art director. There were still a lot of changes done later. We need to be, need to be honest, that's normal in a, in a movie production. But we definitely managed to carry the, the essence of that original script through the whole movie uh, till the end. This production was something totally new uh, to Austrian film industry, right? Um, in, in, in these institutes, there were not even the right terms for an animation movie. When it comes to how would you fund something like that, like decision makers had to figure out what's, what is it actually meant to be. So it was a really, really hard uh, and, and slow process to bring everything on the right track. Again, thanks a lot <laughs> to go through that. Um, I want to show you next a few uh, things of, of Manfred Dijk's lifetime work, right? I mean, there is so much. Uh, but uh, these are some really important examples. On the left side you see uh, the Hudri Budri, is, it's a character he created. Um, it was really famous, you can see that it was used, it was used for Casablanca uh, commercials. So they would put it um, in, in the U-Bahn stations, right, with the ashtrays. Uh, Manfred loved smoking, we need to be clear about that. And on the right side you see the fat cat with cigarette. Uh, he also loved cats a lot. Like rumors are saying that he had like 60 cats at, at a certain time. Um, so yeah, it was obviously clear that he would draw a lot of cats, which are smoking a lot, right? <laughs> um, obviously it was also important to have a like that, the, that the cat would play a, quite an important role in the, in, in the movie. Um, uh, on the next page, on the left side, you see some... <laughs> Manfred was reusing a lot of things quite often, because he figured out that it would do something with his drawings, and then he would reuse it, because he just loved uh, to make uh, people crazy. And this obsessive use of uh, tooth flesh, um, it's just something, it, it, it would add to the ugliness of the character, obviously, but, and that's kind of funny. He meant that it also creates this exaggerated enthusiasm, right? Uh, or you can really see it in some models, it works better. Here on the right side, we have the mayor. Uh, he's gonna have some more roles in that talk, obviously, in the movie. So it was used, um, it was basically tra transferred one to one. Here on the right side, you see some of the drawings of, uh, of uh, Zupfel. It's, uh, it means wiener, it's a kindish, it's, it's a childish word for a small penis, right? Uh, he once said in an interview that it's ridiculous what trick uh, nature played on men to give them something that looks so ridiculous, right? Um, yeah, he loves just to draw it and it got a bit, a bit less in his later work, but... Yeah, another uh, example for that is dirty under underpants, like Brennspur, right? <laughs> uh, he would use that a lot. Again, uh, his character, it, it makes the characters more disgusting and he would just love to uh, upset people. That's, that, that, that was one of his drivers, right? And the standing 69, um, yeah, sexual perversions and obsessions uh, were always as well part of his work. Um, I think it's somehow hilarious how Santiago, uh, the director, brought it into the movie at the very end. And the boy gets thrown out of the carousel and gets smashed into his mother. Um, yeah. So, I also show you here now some concepts that were done early on. Um, with all the script versions that were uh, written over the time, right? And um, with, with all the uh, how you reference, uh, how all the designs and concepts Manfred did already during his lifetime, a small group of talented people could come together and start to develop uh, the environment and uh, most of the cast of the movie. 
Yeah, we see here some concepts um, of locations. On the left side, you see the barber shop. Um, it's Kurtz's place. There is a scene, a humiliating scene for Rotzbub, where they cut his hair. It's uh, here on the toilet. On the right side, you can see how beautiful, basically, the the the, the concept, the original concept, just would get transferred to the uh, 3D world. Um, there was a lot of research going on, obviously, right? Yeah, you want to do the things that you want to have to look the things like they were from the 60s. So they went into a lot of details, and I really, really like that. Klogedanken, uh, toilet thoughts, such a funny idea. Um, and the last thing is um, the classroom as well. You can see how beautiful it it. Uh, Transist from the from the concepts into the final um, model and rendering. And these are a few uh, props that were created. You see the playing cards uh, Brauner and Kurz are actually using when they play. Created some money for the movie and uh, the design for the booklets. Uh, people are reading uh, and in. in certain occasions, right here you see a small uh, booklet that was used in the, in the school environment. You can see here a very early concept of how uh, Rotzbuff uh, could have looked like. Um, these pictures are actually Manfred Dykes, with some nice expressions, really funny, he was around the age of Rotzbuff. Um, what you can see here, that when I saw that the first time, I felt like, oh wow, that looks like really German. So you can see at the, there is this uh, German director, Markus H. Uh, Rosenmüller, right? Who, who worked a lot in the pre-production and in the setup of the movie. So this is something that is more inspired uh, by his idea on how Rod's book could look like. The cast was really big, like assets <laughs> had to create a lot of characters. On the next two pages, I want to show you uh, some of them. We have uh, here Rotzbub with his uh, mother and his father, and of course Rotzbub with uh, Marilina and her mother. You can see here a glimpse of the red dress uh, that we actually used for the um, for the dream sequence. Um, yeah, we see here a lot more characters, right, left, top row. You see all the classmates that were uh, generated for him. We have the teacher, the priest, and Fridolin, which is another classmate that brings him somehow into real trouble. Um, we have here some good guys like uh, Baldi, which is the, I don't know how to say it in English, like the new guy in the village, like Azurgraster. Yeah? Um, he would bring a lot of uh, yeah, issues there as well. And we have Marek uh, next to him. This guy is uh, one of the most iconic uh, Dykes figures, right? Every Dykes fan knows this guy, so we were very happy we could bring him into the movie and that he's a, a really, really nice uh, man. Here on the right side you see Wimmel uh, and Shirley, which are the two friends of him. Uh, and then uh, lower we see the family uh, Protzler, which is the mayor and his wife, like the first woman of the village basically, right? And uh, Fridolin again. And on the right side we have uh, Umsteher which is the town police officer. I mean, Umsteher. The choice for the name is amazing, right? So, during all that uh, development process around assets and characters, uh, a second group of people came to the project, including myself and uh, Santiago Lopez Jover. Um, he is uh, the animation director of the movie. But it turned out quite fast that his influence had to go way further uh, in order to create the movie um, than just be the animation director. Uh, Santiago Lopez Jover, Santi in short for basically everyone, um, studied fine arts uh, in his uh, hometown Valencia with a focus on animation and especially stop motion techniques. Right? Uh, I learned him, I, I learned to know him as a supervisor. He got then a mentor above uh, animation related stuff and finally uh, a friend. He unfortunately can't be here. He is uh, in Ireland right now. He's working for Cartoon Saloon on another project. Um, he should 
do that for you. Uh, it's really sad <laughs> that he's not here. He couldn't attend. He wasn't at the premiere of the movie. It's like there were always reasons why he would not be part of a event, right? If it was Corona or whatever. So, yeah. And again, but still, I hope you like what we do here. Um, yeah, uh, I want to go a little bit more in detail about uh, because because of Santi's um, animation and, and art background. You know, he was the right guy that come in, came in in that moment, and would let's say, polish a few decisions that were made all early on in the production, right? As, a, as an example for that, I want to show you some uh, Mariolina design stuff. You can see here at the very right of that, uh, basically in the middle, you see her with, with the trousers, right, Jack? She, she was looking to Tom Bosch, to twe Tweedy, Tweeder? No, wait, sorry. Um, the Tweedy-like, yeah? I hope that's the right uh, term. Uh, it was obvious, especially when you compare her next to her mother, that, that she needs to look more, she, she needs a more girly like look, right? Um, her design, like Mariolina, was never meant to be a Disney princess, obviously. Uh, but still, we, we wanted to show a, 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 a light style. We, we, you need to understand that the whole lifestyle of this, of this group um, is very different to the town people. Um, um, when, you, when you give, in that moment, the right choice to the character, and you can tell a lot of back, uh, background story, even without saying a, a word, right? So these were, were hard decisions, it were tough decisions, it had to be changed a lot, but it was good. It was done on the, on the lower page, you basically see that we, we decided then to go for the dress version. There was one try to give her like a short, but in the end, it was clear that the dress uh, would work much better than anything else. Um, for those who saw the movie, you recognize probably that we used version 2. You see here all the concepts that were done for that um, dress. Um, we would add here these, these different height stockings and the shoes to bring back a little bit that that uh, uh, wild girl feeling, you know, uh, to bring back a little bit the, the adventurous feeling that she should convey um, in the movie. Um, here, in the, in the second row, you can see her then um, with the Roma people together, like that's the group of Roma people that was created for the movie. So you can see, obviously, like, they are all looking very different to the town people, but also within their group you can see instantly that Magdalena and her mother have kind of a little bit more hip, more modern style, right? It was really important to show Marilina as a, strength, a strong girl from the beginning. For those who saw the movie, like her first appearance is like she's standing in front of the chassis and is like throwing that ball against the wall, like and she's like doing it with some power. And then she would glance over her shoulder at Otspoop and you can clearly see that she's like, what are you looking, right? It's, she would look unapproachable in the very first moment uh, in the movie. Another very, very big part of the story um, was the town fresco. Uh, we had uh, three versions of it, right? We had the old version, you see here on the left side, and we had uh, a version which you, here you see an early concept of that version. We had the version that Knight had, uh, uh, uh uncle would uh, paint over, basically. Obviously, it had to be changed, right? You can see that some of the characters are not the final design. For example, the, the guy left from the mayor is the, um, is the priest. And so, uh, on the right side, you see kind of like a paint over. On one hand, we tried, of course, to not change everything, right? But um, you can see it was important to get like the, the, the appearance of the characters a little bit uh, better in focus and and to go put a little bit more detail to 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 God and the village uh, up there. 
this is uh, all the great work of Bernd Ertl, actually, who is uh, he's here. So, uh, the third version uh, we had of that fresco was obviously the version that Rotzbu uh, had to paint over uh, in the night. So you can see as well here um, a early version of it. Um, and on the left side you see the, the version from Neidhardt, and then you see in the middle a early version of how that could look like. Um, obviously it was uh, drawn by Manfred, so it was important to somehow bring in his style, so you could recognize it. He was obviously not the grown-up cartoonist at that point, but at least you need, we need to make sure that there is somehow a relationship. Um, yeah, and on the very right side you see then a draw over, like a briefing concept um, that uh, Santi did, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, you see probably the biggest change is um, Neithard and uh, Frau Protzler at the left side, but of course, like the god above Sieghard Kirchen. You can see how much more uh, satisfying, let's say, uh, this pose of him is. It's much more dykesy, right? And in the moment in the movie where like the priest is saying like, the liebe God will doch nie auf Sieghard Kirchen scheißen. That's exactly that, that picture. If you would, I guess you would do it like that, right? So, yeah, I mean, I guess just about these frescoes, you have a, a, a hour talk by itself. So, uh, let's just move on. I'm going to show you a little bit more artwork of the movie that just passed by way too fast. On the left side, we have a, uh, both are drawings that Otzbuk does at the very beginning and that Wimmel and uh, Krasberger are selling uh, afterwards. You have here some notes from, um, uh, from Santi about to put more appeal on Schulze's uh, pose and, and the guys need more taxi face, right? Uh, on the right side you see a really cleaned up version as it is in the movie. We see here an a early version of the, of the wild boa, 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 boa um, drawing of the priest. And the right version is the, the cleaned up version that is actually in the movie, the very beginning. And the last example is, uh, yeah, this is the, the first drawing he does from Mariolina during he gets drunk uh, in Chessy, somewhere in the middle of the movie. Uh, it's just a really, really beautiful scene and a really nice drawing of her. And yeah, on the right side, you see what uh, Wimmel and uh, Kasperger are actually making out of it, right? So that's the drawing that really gets him into trouble. And for a good reason, I would say. So, I have now a few pictures about modeling, and it's actually two pictures about modeling and then one picture about real. No, nothing special going on on these models. It's very, very uh, clear and, and, and normal mesh flow. Um, I want probably point uh, to something that was actually creating issues in the production for us. So when you build a model, you can care about these things. When you look here at these, uh, at these shapes at the side of Rotzbub, um, the problem is if you, if you create a model with someone who is not so experienced in 3D, right, and you just do it in, in the A-pose, like, some of the shapes are probably not that super interesting. And that was the reason why it, this happened. So, right, it's like a dress that comes out of the trousers. So the problem is, since if you don't spend a lot of effort and time in reading and creating like, controls and stuff, like, no matter what Rotzbub did, you always would see that this is kind of is there. So don't try to avoid uh, things like that. Um, we see here the face. It looks not as good. It's a little bit because of the pose, how everything is distorted. Uh, but yeah, you can see here as well, nothing uh, really special going on here. Uh, these hair tubes that were there uh, was given by the production to the animators to get a better idea of his hairline, obviously, with creating expressions and uh, pose the eyebrows, um, because the, the hair system was just too complicated to put it in real time and it would just slow us down a lot. 
Um, you can see here the rig. It's, it's actually quite basic stuff. Um, there was, it was a special rig because uh, the development guy would not use uh, any plan shapes or something uh, fancy, right? Uh, the whole rig was set up with uh, joints and skinning, which uh, was done by him because he would create this auto setup uh, that he then can apply to all the characters. And you saw it's, it's a lot, like we had 56 uh, characters to create for the movie. Um, and then he would adjust it based on the, on the, on the model. So uh, basically a quite a default rig to use. We, we would have here, you can see a little bit uh, controllers that look not so familiar because the eyebrow controls are up there on that pose. So these three on the left side and on the right side and uh, these here in that area were added later in the process because you just, because we wouldn't have plan shapes, we needed more controls to be able to, to get nice shapes into the eye line and the eyebrows and all that stuff. So, yeah, and as well on the whole body you can see all just default things, uh, three, uh, uh, three controls, torso set up, normal IKFK uh, systems. Nothing fancy on it, besides the fact that they were super, super fast. Um, it, it was even working to do all these um, crowd scenes at the end of the movie um, without like a special crowd uh, setup. Like Aaron, I think, uh, had a lot of work there to do and suffered a lot <laughs> under this. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, that's basically that's basically all I can say for now to the rig. I have later a little bit more. Um, I want to tell a little bit about the process from the storyboard to the animatic. Uh, it was always a discussion about how you would transfer Manfred Dyke's work, which was always just a picture into an animated movie. Right? Um, his big ingenuity was basically that he could always set the statement with just one drawing. So how would you do that? And how would you put that into an animation movie? Um, back then, Santi had uh, to set up a storyboard crew, right? We needed to create a storyboard, and uh, so we couldn't get an animatic out of it. Uh, he had basically days to do so. I have to say, for me, it was super impressive to understand that a Spanish guy who would know nothing about Manfred Dykes was able to jump so fast and so deep into that matter that he would be able to bring so many uh, refer references of, the, of, of Manfred Dyke's work into the movie and that he could direct it uh, the way he did. You need to plan everything. Uh, what you don't plan uh, in the storyboard stage is most likely not going to be uh, in your movie. Because of some of these uh, qualities and the quality of the uh, animation uh, storyboard team that we had, we got an animatic that was a really great roadmap and plan on how the movie would look uh, in the end. Uh, he could even add like certain um, acting beats to it. And uh, you, you get a really good understanding if a certain uh, situation, if a certain sequence would work or not. Um, the editor of uh, Rotzbuck, Philip Bittner, also got a great friend. He was not working in animation before. Um, he told me once a story that he got super excited uh, when he would uh, work on a run of a character, right? And he would have different panels. And he started to experiment and would just hold that up pose on the run, you know, one frame more to emphasize a little bit dynamic and the weight of the run. So it was for him as an editor kind of funny to play around with these animation related things. Um, on the next example that I want to show to you, you see um, some storyboard examples. Of uh, the opening sequence. Um, you can see it's basically more than or more or, uh, two or more panels of a shot. Like the first shot is two panels, 
and you can see the nurse coming closer to, um, uh, to the mother and then she takes the boy over and the boy is screaming and then he's um, uh, finding out something that he's, uh, he kind of calms him down a little bit. Uh, it's quite funny. It's, it's, it's a lot effort to spend to create a storyboard in that detail, right? But you end up with the opportunity to really time out the scene and to really understand early in the game if something is working or not. Uh, the next thing I want to show to you is actually uh, that sequence, uh, these panels combined uh, to the animatic. And I will show you additionally um, a, early, um, a early concept of how the opening credits could work, right? It was a really, really nice idea to do it, but at that point it's obvious, like, you need to just uh, create a new sequence and then you need to, to animate all that, right? Um, and the effort would have been too much, and to be honest, in the end it was also a little bit of a question how good it would fit uh, to the overall style um, of the movie. Um, we have a, a little bit of a problem, right? We start the movie um, with Hotspur's birth, and then we have a quite big time jump to the moment where he's in school and where he already kind of established his drawing skills. So, oh yeah, that's the priest. Um, so, the idea still was to, to use the opening credits to show his evolution. Um, and uh, what I want to show you now is a second uh, version of that, another experiment, like in layouts, and sorry, in uh, storyboard animatic stage, it's just easier and nicer to uh, explore certain ideas, right? It's just cheaper. Um, uh, this was also not in the movie. Uh, it's just a... Ah, it's a mummy. I can draw that, right? So that's the overall idea, right? Like if you see, uh, you draw what you see, um, and uh, yeah, it would have been a nice. Uh, that's a, of course the father is drinking, right? And he doesn't look very happy, so we draw a father drinking. Yeah, and you see he's kind of growing up, right? You show the names. It would have just been too much of an effort. And to be honest. It works just great to put the opening uh, sequence, uh, to put the opening credits into the uh, Utero sequence, which is kind of a little bit of a weird thing to say, but anyway, <laughs> um, that's what happened, right? So yeah, we would also think about establishing certain of his uh, kind of character, like he's, 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 he's doing that a lot uh, during the movie, right? So the idea was to use that opening to establish that as well, and then uh, the, the, like the pump thing, so yeah. When we were working um, on the animatic, on the storyboard, we had a special opportunity. Because, as I told earlier, because of the fact that uh, this uh, group of people, these designers, were already working on the cast and on the environment, we had uh, already 3D models, even with rigs, available. So we could uh, combine the traditional 2D approach, drawing boards, 
put together into an animatic, um, right into a 3D pre realization um, uh, work. We could just combine that, right? As I said, we had already locations as well, so we had the perfect opportunity to kind of bypass a little bit of that uh, animation, uh, animatic part, and um, uh, then convert like this 3D stuff directly into the movie, so we could work already with the final camera, and um, that is obviously helpful and saved us uh, a little bit of time. In the end, we, we end up with 25% of the whole animatic uh, being in 3D already. So what I want to show you next is a example of that, like we have this part of the animatic, uh, we would then add later a previous shot uh, into it um, quite late in the game. And then you can see how we just switch into a, into a 3D part um, of the movie. And the models are super rough, right? But this doesn't matter, obviously. It's, it's just helpful uh, for planning and, uh, yeah. Sorry. So short sauce, no? <laughs> um, yeah, after a lot of hard work and I have to be honest, a few frustration, uh, frustrating decisions that had to be made, we had a animatic of the movie. Like we were really, really happy. The only problem was it was too long. It was a hundred minutes long, right? Um, because of Santis and the team's quality, it was that clear roadmap. We could uh, stay true to the animatic till the very end of the process. I'm going to show you an, an example right away um, where you see the uh, animatic and the final movie. And you can see that it's, it, it was really, we were really able to, 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 to stay true to that uh, till the very end.
we all enjoyed that version of the movie a lot. Um, as I said, it was just too long. So editorial got the challenge. Um, Philip Bittner needed to cut down the movie to 86 minutes. So he had to lose like 14 minutes of the movie. Um, Joseph uh, once said in the production, um, in film production, you sometimes have to kill your baby. And I guess we did to a certain uh, amount. Um, we have a lot of characters in the movie and they have uh, a lot of purposes. They have, uh, every one of them has an important spot in the story. So this was really the challenge to um, take out some stuff. Like You would not recognize that these things are missing in the movie. Um, the only thing is that some of the motivations and some of the um, actions would probably get not the right setup, or would probably miss a little bit of that setup. I want to show you an example for that um, right here. You see here <laughs> the actual way of, uh, like the actual movie, right? Wolfsburg is leaving the main room, goes into the kitchen. Dann machst du lieber gleich. Komm, jetzt sagt er dein Zimmer. So the next version of it is um, all just in uh, 3D previews, uh, but it shows the sequence in that 100 minutes version. understand probably the tense situation between her and uh, him and her ma his mother a little bit better. What we really lost is that um, Neidhardt is actually gifting that flipbook to Rotzbuch that he's using that night after to do the drawing, uh, the flipbook of um, uh, Trude. So it would just have given Neidhardt a little bit of an even higher entry to the movie especially because at the very end of the movie, the last time we see him, he's crawling out uh, on his knees uh, of the of the frame, so he is like literally he is on the floor, right? And the second thing is a scene that was taken fully out. Um, it was meant to show that uh, Rotzburg has more time to actually draw the the mural because a uh, Neidhardt uh, would be engaged with her. So this is the scene where he actually goes to her window. Weil ich dir zeichnet habe. Reicht es? Ich hab geglaubt, du bist verliebt. Ey, das ist nicht für. Also schon. Aber nicht mit mir. Ich will nur, dass du wen ablenkst. Mit deiner Schönheit. Für ein paar Stunden. Jetzt? Ja. Geht das? Bitte. Man muss mich aber zurecht machen und umziehen. Du darfst zuschauen. For me, the, the most downside of, the, of, of cutting down the movie for 14 minutes, which was good and uh, production and Philip made great choices, uh, was that we had to lose so much of the work from uh, Katharina Strasser, she would do the voice acting for Trude, and she was really, really great. So that was very, very sad. Um, yeah, I have to speed up, so uh, animatic uh, was basically done. Um, it was shortened, it was great. Uh, we end up with uh, 1,363 shots in the movie, which created another LRC, like, what? 
uh, it would make an average shot length of uh, 3.4 seconds, which is quite a lot for such a short movie. It's more like an action movie. Um, but they managed uh, to do it, obviously. Uh, I remember that layout screening. Um, Tom actually uh, had this awesome rooftop place uh, where he's living. We would uh, meet there all together. We would put up a big screen and a beamer. We had drinks and snacks and we would watch the movie all together. It was a Midsummer Night 2018. Just really beautiful. Four years ago. Crazy. Okay, how do you animate dikes? Uh, next chapter, I need to uh, move faster. So I have a lot of material uh, here. Obviously, when, when we the first time went through the books and all the, the dike stuff, you would find so many reference for posing, for expressions. Like, we animators like, we, we want to animate all of that, right? We want to do everything. But obviously that's not possible. When you remember these uh, drawings with the tooth flash, Manfred's characters were never meant to do a lip sync, right? They were never meant to do a dialogue. So we had to be very careful what we would put in and what we would leave out. Also, uh, the movie was never meant to be a collection of Manfred Dyke's cartoons, right? It should tell the story of this boy. Um, when the mayor puts up this huge ugly green at the very end of the movie, then you see how perfect uh, Manfred Dyke stuff could work in animation. Like he, this character was created from him, and we would just convert it one to one uh, to the to the movie. Um, first, I want to show you some early tests uh, of the pre of the pre-production animation pre-production. Um, you do these tests to figure out about character, to figure out the sweet spot of models. But it's also like a rig test, right? You figure out how to deform the torso and uh, what, you, what you can do with the character. Uh, here on the first one, you might focus on the right guy. You can f clearly feel the power play between them. There is no sound, right? This is not, there, there is no sound, there is nothing. What you see here is just basically an animator and a character model, right? You can feel the power play between the, between the two. The second one is uh, about Rotzbuck's mother. I feel there is also nothing to add. You can see it's about to figure out timing, you know. The next one is about Mushtehe. <laughs> I have a lot how he's putting it back very carefully. And here, finally, we have Baldi, who is right in his mood. see it again. Uh, one of the things here was also to test out like how would he deal with that cigarette, like this all two females, right? There is a problem with all the Dykes figure, right? Like Dykes characters are usually quite fat. Um, uh, you need some special controls to manipulate these bulky uh, shapes and arms and bellies and throats. Or you have, if you're in part of a fancy production, you probably have like some muscle system, some skin system, probably you can abuse like cloth simulation or something. I have to admit, we didn't have all of that, right? We would uh, just have to use controls in a smart way. I want to talk about a, a small example. Um, if you want to make a character breathing, 
then you can, if you have this three, con uh, three control setup, you can basically rotate the middle one forward, the up one a little bit backward, and what you then get is like this in the character, right? When you then add like some shoulder movement and some head movement, you basically get uh, the feeling for breathing without uh, creating any automated system or any underlying system. You don't want to do that in order to create a fast rig. So whenever you can bypass these things, um, don't, don't do it. Nothing slows down animation more. <laughs> Nothing slows down animation more than a, a, a slow rig. And in 2D animation, you obviously don't have all these problems. As you can see on the next example, um, that actually Santi uh, did for the movie, it's the, the animation he did for the flipbook. I have two versions, uh, like a rough line test. It's just too short, and you even never see it like that in the movie. And here we have the clean version. Of it. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> I have to say. Um, even that story is based in a, in, a, in a true story. He would not just uh, sell uh, pictures of girls to his classmates. He actually did that by himself. Like he would not need a woman to bring him into trouble. Um, he drew as well a flipbook back then. And in that flipbook, the girl would keep the pantheon, as we see here. And in an interview, he told the story that this was mainly because he would just not know what was under it at that time. <laughs> what a beautiful story. Um, I end up with showing you a few cycles. No, we are so late, I'm leaving that out. I'm going to show you now um, uh, four videos about uh, short progressions that are in the actual movie. Um, Three of them are done by my beautiful colleague, who is here, Tom. And then I'll show one of myself as well, to not expose just someone else. Was ist das? Weltklasse. Du bist schön. Selbst nur ein version like he would put himself into the middle. You would hear add here like Uli Bein uh, a small video from her from the from the voice acting from the recordings. Beautiful. Tom, thank you very much. Again, as I said, do not just expose someone else.
Wir haben tot verzürnt, das sieht man ja. Also ab in die Kirche alle miteinander. Wir haben tot verzürnt, das sieht man ja. Also ab in die Kirche alle miteinander. Three minutes. Three more minutes. <laughs> Three more minutes. Uh, I have to cover LRC a little bit. Ah, it's so. Like, we as an animator, we as animators, right? We just see most of the time the um, uh, viewport blast of Maya or, or which system ever we use. So, for me, LRC does like this super exciting work of bringing all that glory in way after we finish our work, right? It takes sometimes months before we can see it. Unfortunately, and no one of the LRC team can be, be with us here. Uh, all the LRC, all the modeling, all that stuff was done by a small, really small group of super talented and great people uh, in Salzburg. So that's also why they are not here. Um, they used every resource they could get. Like some of them over there would fill out like five different positions over the uh, production. You know, like they were not moody, no nothing. They would just they would just do what it needed. And like, I mean, LRC in that movie had such a pressure and time, uh, time pressure uh, from the beginning. Uh, we, uh, we really appreciate what they did. We would miss so many details and so many fun small things in the movie if they, if they wouldn't have done their indescribable work. I want to show just for a moment um, one of the color boards we used for the movie. You can see here how we try to stay true to Manfred's color, uh, color palette. Like uh, here you see a night, uh, a night uh, drawing, and we did, did that here, also the this daylight sky. What is really interesting to see um, what they created with the, they, they went into this kind of aquarel style that Manfred used a lot. They wanted to make it look like the backgrounds are kind of drawn by Manfred. So when you look here at these trees, and when you then combine that um, with the work here, here, it's, it's giving it quite an interesting look. Uh, and it works better the more the stuff uh, goes into the background. You can see here how these trees look not like normal 3D trees, right? Um, as well with the faces, uh, we try to create something that is looking as close as possible to Manfred Dijk's work. And the more we go into the background, the more you can see how these faces move more into somehow a certain aquarelle color look. Right? As well, I need to point, and that's the last thing I do, um, on all the details in the background. You can see here the picture of the mayor. I mean, it makes sense that the picture of the mayor is in every location in that uh, village, right? But it's a drawing of Manfred, and they brought in so much of it. Really beautiful. Um, yeah, the last thing is a not so much a color board, it was more a mood board. It was meant to show the evolution of time and locations um, in the movie. Back then there was a discussion about reorganizing sequences and probably delete another one. But uh, with this, it was important to understand um, how the color and the mood uh, would evolve over time and that it's dangerous to do more change uh, to the whole thing. Guys, uh, the very end, uh, there is the, the Caricatur Museum in Krems, I don't know if you, if you know, it, there is an exhibition of Manfred Dijk's work, always, if you're interested, go there. For me, the most impressive thing was actually to see how much detail this man would put into slightly small paintings. It's quite crazy because in all his booklets, the stuff is sometimes like really big, like it's an H4 page, right? And then you see the original, and the original is like a quarter of it. But it's still working because you put so much detail into it, it's hilarious to look at. So if you're interested in dikes, you should go there, take your parents or your grandparents and make a trip with them. Guys, sorry, it's late. Uh, this is it. Um, appreciate your attention. I'm not sure if you have time to ask questions.
gonna stay anyway. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna watch the Rubicon talk yeah, as well. So yeah, no, there's uh, unfortunately no real uh, time for a Q and A. Um, if you have any questions, Mickey will be around, and you can ask him, approach him. Uh, Tom is probably around, uh, and we'll answer some other questions. Some of the other people working for the project, uh, we're really thankful, grateful. Uh, you had us, um, uh, we had you, and um, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, we're going to have a little break because we kind of need to reset the stage. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Yeah. That sounds, uh,